Let's give us a confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Our believers, may we greet each other. May we become active believers. With this word, today's message is entitled Covenantal Devotion. When our believers hear the word devotion, what do you feel? Does it bring a sense of burden and discomfort, or does it come up with thoughts of joy, thanksgiving, blessing, and opportunity? I believe that Yewon Church believers are more likely to experience the latter. And I say this because of the devotions and the examples you've portrayed thus far. Many people feel burdened by the idea of devotion, and that's because they connect it to monetary offering. So there's a saying, it says, in the end, it's all about money. And so many people feel like that monetary offering is burdensome. But when we think about devotion, we have to broaden our understanding because financial offering are just one part of devotion. Devotion includes everything we do to expand God's kingdom. And that spectrum is quite broad. As today's message suggests, devotion is about fully committing and wholly committing our bodies and minds to the work of God and going all in and concentrating. For the kingdom of God, for the work of saving souls, and for the position that God has given to me. And that's why all the departments and all the time that you give, all your resources and various ministries, sharing the gospel in the in the fields and participating in domestic and international evangelical camps, all of these are devotions that you give for the church for for God and all of that will be pleasingly received by God. Every Sunday when I see those who volunteer to manage the parking, I am deeply and gratefully moved because it's extremely challenging to just stand outside in the heat, especially during these scorching hot days. And these, this climates and temperatures that we're experiencing almost for the first time. And yet people stand there in the, under the heat and in the parking garages and devote themselves for the safety of our believers. When I see you, I am so, I feel a lot of respect for you. And whenever I see them come in with their vests, they're so beautiful in my eyes. And I also see individuals who serve in the church cafeteria and various departments, ministries, and who evangelize. All of that is devotion. All the more so when people are attacking our denomination, our church, causing misunderstandings and disturbances, seeing you overcome all of that and sharing the gospel to save one soul, being evangelism disciples in the field. And I see that there are many encouragers and deacons who do so. May you all be used by God in the expansion of God's kingdom through the church. And that is a covenantal devotion. That is what brings the greatest joy to God. Today's passage records a woman's devotion, and no one knew that no one knew that that it was time for Jesus to bear the cross. Only Jesus knew that. But this woman brought an alabaster flask of pure nard ointment, which was the, the most expensive perfume of the time, and poured it on Jesus' head. 
At that time, everyone had long hair. And some disciples reacted angrily to the woman's act of devotion. They say, why was the ointment wasted like this? They say, wasted. But contrary to their criticism, Jesus responds, why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. People criticized the woman's devotion as misspent and wasteful. But Jesus instead praised it as a good deed. And Jesus even emphasized that wherever the gospel would be preached throughout the world, this woman's act of devotion would also be remembered. And for what reason is that? It was because the ladies, the woman's devotion, was a covenantal devotion that contributed to God's work. And Jesus' words are being fulfilled even now, 2,000 years after. And we still do speak of the devotion of this woman. Just as Jesus said, it is being fulfilled. In truth, whenever, whether something is seen as devotion or as a waste depends on one's perspective. From a worldly viewpoint, spending our time on this weekend to sit here and worship from early in the morning, preparing worship and coming to church, and give our materials, give our time, and do God doing God's work. In the eyes of unbelievers, this would all be a waste. It would seem foolish. But for us who are children of God, these acts bring the greatest joy, happiness, and thanksgiving. Amen. The high, highest value, the greatest value in our saved lives is used is to be used as instruments of God to fulfill God's covenant. Oh, God is using me. That's a glorious thing. Oh, for God to use me as an instrument, you should be rejoiced. Through today's passage, may all church believers stand as historical witnesses of covenantal devotion, and I bless you in the name of the Lord to do so. Point number one is the root of devotion. Verse 3 reads, And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. In the scripture, Bethany is about three kilometers away from Jerusalem. And, and it was also where you, Jesus usually went when he came to Jerusalem and took a break from his ministry. And Jesus performed wonderful signs and healing in Bethany as well. And a representative example was when the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead when Jesus called Lazarus to come out of the dead and he did and also Simon from the passage who was a leper he had been healed by Jesus and so Simon because Jesus had healed his leprosy had invited Jesus to his place and held a feast with a heart of gratitude. But while Jesus was eating, a woman brought a costly ointment flask, broke it, and poured it over Jesus' head. And in today's passage, it doesn't name who that woman was, but if you look at John chapter 12, which also addresses the same event shows that it was Mary who was Lazarus's sister, the sister of Lazarus who was 
who is brought back from the dead. And Mary poured this ointment, the nard, the most valuable ointment at that time, over Jesus' head. Jewish women at that time prepared an ointment as a hope for their marriage at that time. And from Egypt, and so if you were to go on a trip, a pilgrimage to, to Egypt, you'll see that they're one of the most significant tourist sites in Egypt are and are uh, are tourist sites that sell perfume and fragrances because it's so hot there they have developed these types of perfumes and fragrances to cover up that scent and so back then women had prepared ointment or perfume or fragrance as a hope chest for their marriage However, this Mary had generously poured that ointment over Jesus. And back then, the ointment nard in the passage did not come from Israel. It was extracted from plants from India or the Himalayas and had the highest value. And according to scripture, the value of this ointment is more than 300 denarii. The worker's daily wage back then was one denarius at a time. And so for a worker had to save a whole year without spending a, den a single denarius to purchase this nard. When we say that it's about $10, our minimum wage is $10, that it, you, we can see how expensive that ointment was. But as Mary was pouring this ointment, the person beside her angrily reproached her. If you look at verses 4 to 5, it says, Here were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. They were saying why she was wasting expensive ointment and saying it would have been much better to sell and distribute it to the poor. However, People who, are, who say that are never individuals who actually help the poor. People who judge and criticize, they're not try there to help. They're there to criticize. And so they say, oh, it would have been better to sell and distribute to the poor. But they, and they were attacking Mary. And that was just how expensive. That's how high of value the ointment Mary poured on Jesus at that time had. However, Mary acted as if this ointment was valued nothing and gladly she generously poured it all over Jesus and the reason Mary was able to devote with such joy is that she had the mindset of grace and thanks deeply for Jesus Mary usually enjoyed listening to the words of Jesus when Jesus visited Bethany her sister Martha was always busy having to make food and prepare food, but all Mary was interested about was the word of Jesus, and she always received grace hearing about the kingdom of heaven. And moreover, when her brother Lazarus was dead, Jesus came and raised her brother from the dead with just a word, and seeing that, Mary realized that Jesus is the true Christ, the true Messiah who came to save mankind. And she experienced that. And that is why experiences are so important. She experienced the fulfillment of the Word of God. And so her devotion had root, was rooted from that deep gratitude and mindset of grace that she had received an experience. A characteristic of those who receive grace and those who succeed in worship is that they have different worldviews and values in their life. Their priorities are different. They break free from the old habits and the old nature. The priority of their life is completely changed. 
However, there was someone who showed the completely opposite attitude to Mar Mary. When Mary poured the perfume on Jesus, those who rebuked her are not named in the passage, but Mary, but in parallel passages, we see that it was the disciples of Jesus who rebuked her, particularly Judas Iscariot, who strongly criticized her, mentioning that the perfume could have been sold for 300 denarii. Denari. In fact, Judas was already captivated by money. As we've seen in verses 10 to 11 in this passage after the incident of the perfume, Judas was all, we can see that Judas was loved, he loved money so much. And if you look at the following verses, after the incident with the perfume, Judas goes to the chief priests to negotiate how much they would give him to betray Jesus. And it said that the chief priests, they were happy and they rejoiced. And he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Judas said, when I go and kiss him, that will be Jesus. That will be a sign. And he became one who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's how he lived a life that was dominated by materialism, by money. Money was the best thing for him. And ultimately, that led him to eternal curses. From a spiritual perspective, Although Ju Judas had followed Jesus for three years, just like the other disciples, he never truly received grace from Jesus' words. Seeing the countless miracles and the words of Jesus, he received no grace. He just thought, oh, you know, they're just, wow, what a lie, what an outward show. Oh, he's, they're deceiving and this being deceptive. He did not receive any grace, and he was just held by the self-centeredness of Genesis 3, the materialism of Genesis 6, and the worldly success-centered life of Genesis 11. However, Maria from Mary from today's passage was different. And so though she had fewer opportunities, every time she met Jesus, she received his word as sweet as honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. May all believers of Yewon Church, especially our newcomers, concentrate on receiving grace from the Word more than anything else. The time of receiving the Word is a time of spiritual battles. In my opinion, even though you might go to church for decades, there are individuals who cannot receive grace. Even there were some, even amongst the disciples of Jesus, so that it might surely be, but you must fight a spiritual battle. It is the moment when your spiritual life or death is determined. That is the time of worship. And that's why Satan tries to sow distractions, make you drowsy, and keep you from focusing. He hinders you from receiving grace. And what is the characteristic of those who don't receive grace? They are negative. And so because they don't receive grace, they are always negative. They only speak of negative things. While doing Dar the Darpa movement for 30 years, they don't receive any grace from Darpa. They have not come to an answer at all. And so in the end, it is all revealed. And because they don't receive any grace, they're annoyed. They're irritated. They become angry. They think they're being ignored and dismissed. And so they are enraged by that. It goes the same for the church. If you do not receive grace, then at one moment, in that one moment, everything will come to the surface. And they start to speak negative things. Spiritually, may you be armored spiritually 
and be fully armed and hold on to the word completely. And I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to follow the flow of the pulpit in any situation and make the wise essential choice of Mary rather than the introductory choice of Judas Iscariot. And point number two, whole devotion. It says, but Jesus said, in verses 6 to 8, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor, poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Jesus says that Mary did a good thing. In the original passage, a good thing is written as Kalin Ergon, which stands for the work joining God's holy ministry or the great work that Jesus receives with joy and remembers forever. We call that the good work. Therefore, it says that Mary's doing was not just an ordinary act. Jesus saw it and said it is a beautiful act, a good thing. He says that the poor will always be with you and you will have time to help the poor later. But when it comes to what Mary did for me, it was a precious act that you won't be able to do later on. Jesus had to die on the cross to save mankind, which was his essential reason he came to this earth. But at that time, during biblical times, there was a ritual to put ointment on the dead on one's body. In Palestine, they had to put this ointment on the dead's body. And they just would put, they didn't wrap the, they didn't really uh, put anything over them, but they had to just put fragrance over the bodies because they all believed in the resurrection of the body. So they would always put these ointments over the dead. And knowing this, but for Jesus, he there wouldn't be any time for him to have been poured ointment in his body because the day after his crucifixion it was the Sabbath so no one could be able to do so. And so seeing this Jesus said that Mary was preparing his burial in advance. Mary's devotion was a covenantal devotion that was used for God's redemptive work. And so the covenantal devotion that God receives. In verse 8, it said that Jesus, it says Jesus said, to Mary that she was, had done what she could with all her might. Mary was not from an affluent family. She had no parents. All she had was her brother, Lazarus, and her, her sister, Martha. It was just the three of them. And so she wouldn't have had much financial leisure, but she poured all her savings, everything that she had to Jesus by her act and even that she did it gladly no regardless of what others might say beside her she only looked upon jesus and gave everything to him when you devote yourself may you not look at the response or the reaction of those around you because if you if you are conscious uh, conscientious of of what others might think of you then that's not a devotion that god desires the less people know, the better. The less people know, the better. And that's when you know that God has received that devotion. Pa American preacher Vance Hafner once gave a sermon on total devotion. On total devotion. And after the service, an intelligent-looking woman approached this preacher and said, Pastor, why did you preach about a level of devotion impossible to achieve? Wouldn't it be more realistic to challenge us to be 80% or 90% devoted? And at that time, Pastor Vance Havner responded by saying, 
Ma'am, would you be satisfied if your husband were 80, 90 percent devoted to you, but devoted the remaining 10 percent to someone else? If our devotion isn't a wholehearted devotion, then it wouldn't be true devotion. Indeed, God desires 100% love and 100% devotion from us. All believers here in church, may you go to the place of 100% and whole devotion. Then what happens when we do so? Verse 9 reads, And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Mary received the incredible blessing of being remembered forever and wherever the gospel is preached. She was made a model of devotion. Likely, Mary wouldn't have fully understood that Jesus' death was near. She wouldn't have known that. However, the grace she received from Jesus and her heart that loved Jesus went beyond human calculations and became a person of devotion that was remembered forever. She didn't make any calculations. She didn't look what was beneficial to her. She simply only liked Jesus so much. She loved Jesus so much. And Jesus was so precious to her that she just did that for Jesus. No other meaning beside that. But because of that, it became a devotion that would be remembered forever. Until the day the Lord returns, may you be able to become models of whole devotion where you are remembered until the day, until wherever the gospel is spread, until the day the Lord returns. There's a saying, the devil's most useful tool isn't an active sinner, but an inactive Christian. In other words, a Christian who isn't devoted, a Christian who doesn't devote himself, is the tool that Satan uses. And thus, as time goes on, there are less people who devote themselves. And the reason is because they're continuously being attacked by Satan. Whatever the reason. Professor Donald McGowan McGovern, known as the father of church growth studies, observed that about 10% of church members are actively involved and 80% are somewhat asleep and the remaining 10% are completely fully asleep. He emphasized and he said, do not wake up the 10% who is in deep sleep because when you try to wake them up, they'll be irritated and grumpy. And so those who come to church without doing anything, they're deep in deep sleep. You shouldn't touch them or try to wake them because if you wake them up, they'll be grumpy and irritated. Where are, what, what do you pertain to? If you look closely inside the church, There are many Christians who are inactive, who do not devote themselves. And so our church must be a place that completely overturns this common paradigm. May each and every single one of you become 100% fully active, absolute disciples of Christ. If you've received God's grace, if you've been saved, if you've then you are able, you can do things for the church, even if that's sweeping. It, 
the front yard. What will I repay this salvation, this grace that I've received? That should be your mindset and inside your daily lives. May you create vibrant spiritual movements. They have no gospel inside your field, inside your your workplace and your meetings. All lives are dying, but you are alive. You have the weapon to revive lives. Then to those who you meet, to whoever you meet, am I saying that you have to always talk about Jesus? No, whenever the time comes and when you finish talking and discussing, then you could passing by say one thing and to that person that becomes an answer for their life it becomes their lifeline and we call that the spiritual movement and we call that the covenantal devotion what is what what does god desire there's only one thing it is the saving of lives and so the field that allows souls to come back to the Lord and call upon the Lord. And so while no matter how much you fast and no matter how much you shout upon the Lord up on the mountain, why is it that God does not answer? Because you must first seek what God desires, His kingdom and His righteousness. Then even if you don't seek it out, God gives it to you. He is almighty. Is this God who does things that makes no sense? That seems impossible. In the wilderness, when they resented God and resented Moses, when they resented God and sm spoke of unbelief, God was angered and sent. And sent a venomous serpent. And they were afraid and they went to Moses and asked Moses to pray upon God to, to take that serpent away, that snake away. And so Moses prayed to God and he was told to put a bronze serpent and he told the people if you look upon this then you will live and those who looked upon the bronze serpent did live how can you explain that Sci scientifically in any other way the way that God restores life it makes no sense inside your life may life be revived And may you become, may you live historical lives that save lives wherever you go. And may you all become the people of God who through your monumental life be leave behind an eternal inheritance, masterpiece, and legacy. Let us pray. Father God, today you have given us the word entitled Covenantal Devotion, Mary's Devotion, this devotion that became a monumental devotion, may we also become those who devote ourselves to leave behind the monumental devotion for the kingdom of God and for the saving of souls. May we be able to stake our lives. May we be able to wholly devote ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.